Demna Vazalia is a name that has been making fashion headlines time and time again over the past few years, and despite that fact, he's still shrouded in a sense of mystery. Who is he? How did he rise to the top of a major luxury fashion house at such a young age? And what is the real reason that he's been so closely tied with Kanye West? Well, in this episode of Thread Education, I'm going to be answering all of these questions and much, much more. So without further ado, let's get into it. This is the Demna story. In 1981, Demna Vazalia was born in Georgia. Not the American state Georgia, but instead the European country located just south of Russia. While it's a rather small country, it's one that's seen a fair amount of political turmoil throughout its history, and as a matter of fact, it was technically part of the Soviet Union when Demna was born. The reason I say technically is because by the time Demna was born, there was a growing sentiment within the country that they wanted to secede from the Soviet Union, and although they officially did so in April of 1991, the decision was met with a level of resistance that amounted to violence and bloodshed. Fearing for their own safety, Demna's family fled to Dusseldorf, Germany, but this would actually not be the end of his time in Georgia. You see, the Soviet Union collapsed in December of 1991, and Georgia went on to craft a new constitution in 1995. So while there may have been lingering tensions, things in the country were, all things considered, much more peaceful than they'd been when Demna's family first left. So in 1997, when it came time for him to enroll in a university program, he settled on attending Tbilisi University in Georgia. Now, here is where things get interesting. At this point in his life, Demna was beginning to discover his passion for design. He may not have had strong convictions about becoming a designer, but there was no denying that he had a tendency to gravitate towards the arts. Had it been presented to him as a viable option, he may have chosen to study the arts, but instead, he faced a hurdle that many before him and many after him have faced. Parents who wanted him to pursue a more traditional career path. It's not as if he put up a fight because again, he had no other plans in place, but this did push him down a path that he may not have gone down otherwise. And that path was four years of studying economics at Tbilisi University. That might sound like a lot of time to spend studying something that you're not passionate about, but the reality is that many people find themselves in situations just like this. The only difference here is that Demna didn't look at these four years as a waste of time, he looked at them as the length of time it took to figure out what he actually wanted to do, or at the very least, what he didn't want to do. After graduating in 2001, he moved back to Germany and briefly humored his parents' wishes by looking for a job in finance. But this search of his wasn't much more than a backup plan, because in reality, he was preparing to apply to design school. That's exactly what he did, and to his delight, he was accepted into the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp, Belgium. The Royal Academy of Fine Arts is one of the most storied design schools in the world, and among its alumni it counts some of the greatest designers who have ever lived, including Martin Margiela, Hader Ackerman, and of course the Antwerp Six, who I'll be making a video on in the very near future. So the fair question to ask here might be, how did Demna get into the Royal Academy of Fine Arts? I don't ask that to discredit him in any way, it's just that the Academy is notoriously selective about who it accepts, and at this point in time he had zero design experience to speak of. Not to mention that at the age of 21, he was the youngest student accepted into the Academy that year. The other 40 or so students in his class had been off doing apprenticeships and studying under big name fashion designers, while Demna had been off studying supply and demand curves at Tbilisi University. Suffice to say, he was a bit behind, but what he lacked in experience, he made up for with intuition. What I mean by this is that he was a naturally gifted designer from the very start. Not because he possessed technical skills or any formal training, but because he simply had a unique way of thinking about design. Maybe it had something to do with his unconventional background, or maybe he was just born with it, but whatever the case may be, all we know for certain is that Demna stood out among thousands of other applicants, and so began his tenure at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp. His path to getting into the academy had certainly been unique, and his path to graduating proved to be no different, because his intuitive approach to design became evident on day one. 
According to some of his classmates, Demna would often choose to sew things by hand while others used sewing machines, and while they were sketching out countless drafts of their designs, he would skip to the actual production process and figure it out as he went. This didn't sit too well with many of his teachers at first, but it didn't take long for them to realize that he didn't need to follow the same process as everyone else to get great results. In fact, one teacher in particular took a very strong liking to his work, and that teacher was none other than Walter van Bierendonck, one of the aforementioned Antwerp Six who had been making waves in the fashion industry with his eccentric eponymous label. Well, Walter was so impressed with Demna's work that after he graduated from the academy in 2006, he decided to offer him an internship. It was just a temporary position helping with some of Walter's menswear collections, but I don't want to understate how big of a deal this was. Much like how the academy is notoriously selective about who it accepts, Walter is notoriously selective about who he works with. Because like many great designers, he is extremely protective of his own creative process. To put this into context, other designers that have interned for Walter include Ralph Simmons and Craig Green, so it goes without saying that he has a sharp eye for emerging talent, and Demna was no different. Also, let's not forget that prior to this, Demna had no hands-on experience working in the industry, because he'd gone straight from studying economics to enrolling at the Academy of Fine Arts. So Walter was really helping him take the next step forward in his career by asking him to work on collections for his well-established, highly regarded label. This experience was obviously a very valuable one for Demna, but even back then he knew that he wanted to branch off and do something of his own. So while working the internship, he was also working on his own women's wear collection. Even though he was fresh out of design school and didn't have a huge body of work that he could point to, the fact that he had graduated from the Royal Academy of Fine Arts and worked alongside Walter van Bierendonck gave him the credibility that he needed to land a spot at Tokyo Fashion Week in 2007. There, Demna presented his women's wear collection, and while I don't believe there are any photos of the collection on the internet, I think we can safely assume that it didn't have the impact he'd been hoping for. I'm not sure if this was supposed to be his attempt at launching a solo career, but none of the buyers at the show were interested. That's not to say it was a bad collection, but you have to remember that he was still finding his footing as a designer, and he didn't have the resources of a larger label. Speaking of which, the only real option left for Demna was to go work for a larger label, and to that end, it was in 2009 that he accepted an offer to join Mason Martin Margiela as a women's wear designer. Now, in my opinion, this was a very interesting time for him to join the label, because 2009 is the same year that its founder, Martin Margiela, decided to retire from fashion. What this meant for Demna is that he was joining a highly respected label with a very rich history, but that he was doing so at a time of major change. In fact, Demna never once got to meet or work with Martin. At first, you might think that this made things more difficult for him, but in a twist of fate, it actually worked in his favor. You see, after Martin retired, the label wanted to continue building upon his legacy and wasn't looking to make any drastic changes to their approach. Now, of course, Martin himself wouldn't be there to give them guidance, so when Demna joined Margiela, he had no choice but to do a deep dive into the brand's archives, and he sort of reverse-engineered Martin's design language. I don't mean to say that he was copying his design language, but instead what I mean is that he studied Margiela's most fundamental principles and then applied those principles in new, exciting ways. That was the only way for him to achieve some level of continuity between the old collections and the new ones that he was working on. In the end, it paid off as Demna was able to help craft some masterful collections, and at the same time, his skill set as a designer advanced to a whole nother level. In a later interview with ID Magazine, he acknowledges that fact, saying that his time at Margiela was sort of like a master's program after graduating from Antwerp. It wasn't just a name to add to his resume, it really did change the way he thought about fashion. And now that he was armed with this new perspective, he began preparing for the next stage in his career. Although I wouldn't classify Demna's time at Margiela as a rise to stardom, he did turn quite a few heads. And that's why he was approached by Louis Vuitton in 2012 with an offer to join them as a senior designer of women's ready-to-wear collections. At face value, this promised to be a fantastic opportunity, and to be fair, it was, but things went south almost immediately. 
According to some sources, Demna had trouble fitting in with the other members of Louis Vuitton's design team. Perhaps there was a bit of culture shock going from a smaller label like Margiela to a major luxury fashion house where he had less decision-making authority, but whatever the case may be, we know that he was less than pleased with his new role. To make matters worse, by the time that he actually joined Louis Vuitton in 2013, then-creative director Mark Jacobs was already planning his exit. Perhaps this gave the team an air of impermanence that didn't sit too well with Demna, so by the time that Nikola Jeskier replaced Mark Jacobs as creative director, Demna was already planning his exit, or at least trying to create some sort of backup plan. You see, the one thing that he'd been lacking this entire time was complete creative control. Other than the one-off solo collection that he presented at Tokyo Fashion Week, he'd pretty much gone straight from design school to working for other designers. That's not necessarily a bad thing, and in hindsight it did put him on the path to success, but the fact of the matter is that he'd just gotten to the point where he wanted to do his own thing. So while still working at Louis Vuitton, he quietly banded together a group of forward-thinking creatives including his brother Garam, and a handful of other designers he'd met over the years. Aligned by the goal of challenging the status quo, they formed a collective, and they decided to call that collective Vetmont. Vetement is quite literally the French word for clothing, and you can sort of interpret that as Demna's first jab at the fashion industry. For a long time, Parisian designers had been hailed as the golden standard and given much of the spotlight. So for Demna, who was born in Georgia and attended school in Belgium, this was a way of saying, hey fine, if you guys like French fashion so much, I'll just make a French brand. And Vetement by itself is a very tongue-in-cheek name because it comes off as unoriginal and uninspired to those who actually speak French, but it sounds cool and catchy to those who don't. So from the outset, it was pretty clear that the brand would thrive off of being provocative, but that would mean nothing if Demna couldn't channel that into the clothing. And in 2014, just one year after the collective was founded, the moment of revelation came upon us at Paris Fashion Week. Much like he had done back in 2007, he was able to elbow his way onto the Fashion Week schedule as a highly lauded up-and-comer. The collection itself did not disappoint, as it showcased many of the design elements that would become characteristic of his work in the years to come. I'm talking unique, outsized proportions, a primarily dark color palette, and a heavy focus on material. All things considered, I think that this collection provided a solid foundation for the brand, but truth be told, there was nothing about it that really challenged the status quo. At least, not enough to make any headlines. Realizing this, Demna joined forces with his collective once again, and decided that for their spring 2015 collection, they wanted to take it a step further. Generally speaking, this collection was a bit more radical, marked by its inclusion of bright colors, sweatpants, and even the use of graphics. A turtleneck collar embroidered with the word collar was, much like the brand's name, a tongue-in-cheek statement. Because objectively speaking, there is no reason for the graphic to be there, but its mere presence on the garment makes it the focal point. This collection was ultimately a step in the right direction for Vetement, and that was reflected in the reviews it received from the fashion press. Taking note of the positive feedback they'd received, Demna and his team decided to step things up a notch once again for their fall 2015 collection, and in many ways, this is the collection that put them on the map. Rather than hosting the presentation of the collection in a more traditional venue, Demna decided to host it in a club. This alone gave the event an added degree of energy and excitement, but what really created a buzz was the familiar face sitting in the audience that day and that familiar face belonged to none other than Kanye West. Back then, Demna and Kanye couldn't have possibly imagined the ways in which their paths would someday cross, and don't worry, we will be talking about that later, but in the meantime, Kanye's mind was simply set on discovering the next big thing in fashion, and that search had led him to the front row of the third ever Vetement fashion show. Needless to say, the pressure was on, and it's safe to say that Demna delivered. Once again, this collection relied on many of the principal design elements established by the first collection, but this time around he pushed them to the absolute limit. While I don't like to throw this term around every time I see an experimental collection, I think it's fair to categorize this as anti-fashion. Anti-fashion is a design approach that intentionally contradicts current day style norms, and when it's done well, it holds some level of appeal aside from the fact that it's contrarian. In this case, Demna and his team did it very well. The cuts of the garments are almost entirely asymmetrical. 
For example, this suit jacket where the two sides aren't even the same length. They used several logos, but they're almost all in the quote unquote wrong place, like this hoodie where the logo is positioned on the shoulders instead of the chest. And then several of the garments are sewn in the quote unquote wrong place as well, like this t-shirt that's stitched together in the middle. Even the color palette was meant to be contrarian. When they weren't using the color black, they were using colors that clashed, like green and red. Yet, despite all of this, the collection felt cohesive, and it included several pieces that are now considered classics, including the metal logo hoodie. This would become even more apparent in later collections, but Demna's use of casual wear garments such as hoodies and sweats, plus the bold graphics including the literal Thrasher logo, was an early glimpse into his affinity for streetwear design. He was by no means the only designer attempting to blur the lines between high fashion and streetwear, but he was doing it in a highly impactful way that resonated with the audience. Between the cool looking pieces, Demna's reputation as a name to watch for, and of course Kanye's appearance at the show, this collection really helped Vetma build some hype. I kind of want to say that this was the beginning of a cult following, but the reality is that people everywhere were beginning to take notice of the brand, and that included some people in very high places. You see, it wasn't long after the presentation of this fall 2015 collection that Vetma was selected as one of the finalists for the 2015 LVMH Prize. I've talked about this in a few other videos, but in case you aren't familiar, the LVMH prize is an annual prize handed out by LVMH to new designers, and whoever is named the winner receives about $400,000 to put towards their brand and 12 months of guidance from LVMH to help with things like production, marketing, and distribution. So as you can imagine, winning this is a pretty big deal, but for that reason, the competition is fierce. To give you an idea, some of the other finalists in 2015 were Virgil Abloh, Jacques Mousse, and Craig Green, just to name a few. As if that weren't nerve-wracking enough, some of the judges for the prize included Raph Simmons, Karl Lagerfeld, Ricardo Tichy, Jonathan Anderson, Nicola Jeskier, Mark Jacobs, and Phoebe Philo. In the end, the prize was awarded to Marcus Almeida, not to Vetma, but keep in mind that everyone I just listed was now fully aware of Demna and had taken time to look deeply into his work. So even though he didn't win, being named one of the finalists provided him with a ton of exposure. Adding fuel to the fire, Kanye made an appearance in the aforementioned metal logo hoodie, and back in 2015, the Kanye effect was still a very real thing, meaning that if he wore it, it instantly became cool in the public eye. So after just three collections, Vetma was a veritable overnight sensation. With the brand now taking off, he officially left his position at Louis Vuitton, and the idea was that he'd be able to spend more time focusing on his own work. That sounded like a great plan, and it was, but little did Demna know he was about to receive an offer that he simply could not refuse. In 2015, after releasing just six collections at the storied fashion house, Alexander Wang abruptly stepped down as the creative director of Balenciaga. Even today, it's not exactly clear why he stepped down, but one of the leading rumors is that he was struggling to balance his work at Balenciaga with the work he was doing for his own eponymous label. Whether or not that's the case, we don't really know, but what we do know is that Balenciaga was left in dire need of a new creative director, and ideally, one who could help them navigate the complexities of 21st century luxury fashion. What I mean here is that the merging of luxury fashion and streetwear had already been underway for some time, but it was around 2015 that major luxury fashion houses like Balenciaga began realizing that the adoption of streetwear would be essential if they wanted to remain relevant particularly among a younger audience. So with that in mind, they set out in search of a replacement for Alexander Wang that would be able to help them usher in this new era of luxury streetwear, and with his work at Vetma, Demna Vazalia had established himself as the perfect candidate. One of the other great things about Demna is that with his work at Margiela, he had demonstrated his ability to embrace and build upon a brand's history, as opposed to tearing it all down and starting from scratch. 
This was particularly important for Balenciaga, because even though they were looking to move in a new direction, the fashion house places a lot of value in its roots, dating all the way back to its days as a couture house founded by the legendary Cristobal Balenciaga. In Demna, they had found a designer that promised to merge past and present to create something that resonated with fans of luxury fashion and streetwear alike. That said, they offered him the position of creative director in 2015, and although he had just left Louis Vuitton to focus exclusively on Vetements, he knew that this opportunity was too good to pass up. But it was going to be a challenge. Balenciaga was in desperate need of a turnaround, and Vetements, on the other hand, was exploding in popularity. To put this into context, Vetements presented its spring-summer 2016 collection in October of 2015, the same year that Demna announced that he'd be joining Balenciaga, and this show propelled the brand even further into the spotlight. Once again, Kanye was in attendance, this time joined by Travis Scott, and the collection featured the now-iconic DHL shirt. As you may know, DHL is literally just a delivery company, but Demna decided to put the logo on a shirt and send it down the runway. In doing this, much like he had done with the name of the brand, he was taking something simple, dare I say bland, and then reframing it as luxurious. These shirts came with a luxury price tag, and nowadays if you want an original, they're reselling for thousands of dollars. This was a masterclass in marketing, and one of the funny things here is that DHL didn't make a dollar off of it. He asked them for permission to use the logo, and all they asked for in return was 20 of the shirts for their employees. But anyways, the point here is that items like these had a tendency to go viral, and so the hype continued to grow. Now, going back to Balenciaga, Demna made his long-awaited debut with the presentation of his fall 2016 ready-to-wear collection. This was a highly anticipated debut, so the stakes were certainly high, and a fair amount of critics even feared that bringing in such a radical designer would spell disaster for the fashion house. But as soon as the model stepped onto the runway, those fears all but dissipated. Much like he had done at Margiela, Demna spent his first few months as the creative director diving into the Balenciaga archives and studying the work of Cristobal Balenciaga himself. That said, it's no surprise that the collection intentionally referenced some of Cristobal's earlier couture designs, but what really made it special was that Demna effortlessly blended these designs with his own unique style. A great example of this would be the coats with exposed shoulders, which is something he borrowed directly from previous Vetmon collections. There were also abrasive colors, patterns, and asymmetric cuts, so if you ask me, this could be looked at as Balenciaga's first foray into the world of anti-fashion, which is something that would become ingrained in the brand's DNA over the coming years. Suffice to say, Demna's first impression as the creative director of Balenciaga was a strong one, and this was just the beginning. Later that same year, he debuted a shoe called the Speed Trainers, and I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with these because they are largely credited for kicking off what became known as the sock shoe trend. The shoe itself is quite simple, but there was something undeniably appealing about their slim fitting form and subtle display of the Balenciaga logo. Going for a retail price of nearly $700, there's no denying that these were expensive. But before long, nearly every celebrity could be seen wearing them and this drove demand through the roof. In light of the Speed Trainer's success, just about every luxury fashion house came out with their own variation of the sock shoe, and that includes Vetmont. Demna actually ended up collaborating with Reebok to release a Vetmont sock shoe, and this too became extremely popular. Long story short, these sock shoes were just about everywhere in 2017, but being the forward thinker that he is, Demna knew that the market for them would soon be oversaturated and in response to that, he decided to change his course entirely. So in 2017, the year of the sock shoe, he officially unveiled the Balenciaga Triple S sneaker. At first, fans and critics alike were skeptical of the design because it completely defied expectations. Demna, the same designer that had created the sleek, minimalist speed trainer not even a year earlier, was now promoting what appeared to be a clunky dad shoe. And that's exactly what it was. The name Triple S stands for Triple Soul because the base of the shoe is literally three different soles stacked on top of each other. That's about as clunky as it gets, and for that reason, many people weren't into them the same way that they had been into the speed trainers. But therein lies the point. 
Like I said, the market had become way oversaturated with sock shoes, so Demna basically said, okay, I'm just gonna go as far in the opposite direction of this as I can, allowing him to take advantage of an undersaturated market. In hindsight, this was a brilliant move in business tactic, and it's one that helped the brand's sales jump by as much as 60% in the second half of 2017. Balenciaga's unexpected emergence as a powerhouse in the sneaker game helped earn the admiration of the younger generations, which, as we discussed, was exactly what they'd been trying to do. But Demna didn't stop there. In his fall 2017 ready-to-wear collection, he made headlines again by taking the Bernie Sanders campaign logo and reimagining it into a Balenciaga logo. Just to be clear, this debuted after the 2016 presidential election, and this was not meant to be seen as an endorsement, but instead, Demna confirmed that his intention here was similar to his intention with the DHL shirts. All he wanted to do was take a logo that people were used to seeing elsewhere, and then put it on the runway to make it seem fashionable. In other words, it was a statement piece, but it was not a political statement. I mean, I'm sure he had some idea of the reaction that this would get because political tensions in the US were still running high, but the point is that it got people talking. Over the course of subsequent collections, Demna continued pushing boundaries, and one thing that's abundantly clear is that he became more comfortable taking risks as time went on. In other words, he had fully settled into his role as the creative director of Balenciaga, and that's why, in 2019, he made the decision to give the brand his full attention by stepping away from Vetma. This would not be the end of Vetma, as he handed the reins over to his brother Garam, but this signaled to everyone in the industry that Demna was prepared to take Balenciaga to the next level. I'm not just referring to provocative statement pieces, though there would be plenty of those, but I'm also referring to the fact that one of his major decisions after stepping away from Vetma was to bring Couture back to Balenciaga. Just to give some background here, Couture is basically the design and creation of made-to-measure one-of-one garments, which by nature are typically more detailed and highly intricate. Many of the major fashion houses that we know and love today are deeply rooted in couture, but over the years we've seen a major shift towards ready-to-wear clothing, which can be mass-produced and is therefore much more profitable. Now where I'm going with this is that Cristobal Balenciaga was one of the most highly regarded couturiers of all time. And if you've watched my video on the history of Balenciaga, you'll know that after his retirement in 1968, the fashion house shut down altogether. So yes, that's right, there was a period in time where Balenciaga was completely out of operation, and Cristobal's intention was for it to remain that way. But upon his death in 1972, the rights to the brand were passed on to his next of kin. He didn't have a wife or any children, so it's believed that the rights were passed on to his nephew, and that nephew supposedly then sold the rights to a German chemical manufacturer who wanted to use the Balenciaga name to sell perfume. He didn't have a wife or any children, so it's believed that the rights were passed on to his nephew, and that nephew then sold the rights to a German chemical manufacturer who wanted to use the Balenciaga name to sell perfume. The rights were sold once again in 1986, this time to the perfume company Jacques Bogart, but unlike the previous perfume company, Jacques Bogart recognized the weight that the name Balenciaga held in the fashion industry. So with that in mind, they hired the French fashion designer Michel Goma to come in and start producing ready-to-wear collections, which is something that Balenciaga had never done before. The flip side of this coin is that they had zero interests in producing couture collections, because as we discussed earlier, ready-to-wear was far more consumer-friendly, and the honest truth is that they were looking to turn a profit. The appointment of Michel Goma set off a cascade of collections in which the fashion house would struggle to find its footing, and you could argue that these woes lasted all the way up until 1997, when a 25-year-old Nicola Jeskier stepped in to take charge. Nowadays, Jeskier is largely credited with reviving Balenciaga and making it what it is today, but as we discussed, he was replaced by Alexander Wang upon his departure for Louis Vuitton back in 2012, and this resulted in a loss of momentum. Don't get me wrong, Balenciaga was still relevant, but Wang's work simply didn't resonate with fans in the same way. When Demna replaced him in 2015, there was an undeniable shift in energy because people knew that he'd be willing to take risks with his collections. But this also opened the door for some criticism. You see, he was more than capable of captivating the masses, but his style is so unconventional that it led many to conclude that Balenciaga had strayed too far from its roots. Now I get that argument, and to some extent it's true, but my counterpoint would be that Demna is not the one that led the brand down this path. 
Instead, the decision to go down this path was made back in 1986 when they brought in Michelle Goma to convert Balenciaga to a ready-to-wear brand, at which time Demna was just five years old. So I don't really think that the criticism he received was justified, and I honestly think that he himself was mischaracterized. Despite what many were led to believe, Demna has always had a deep appreciation for the histories of the fashion houses that he's worked for. We saw this during his time at Margiela, and we saw it again in several of his early collections for Balenciaga. But I don't think that anyone realized just how deep this appreciation was until 2021 when he announced that Balenciaga would be bringing back couture collections. It had been 53 years since the fashion house had released a couture collection, and while many were excited by the news, others were skeptical about Demna's ability to pull it off. Nevertheless, all we could do was wait and see, and in July of 2021, we finally got our answer as Balenciaga debuted its Fall 2021 Couture Collection. So let me start by saying that this collection would pay homage to Cristobal Balenciaga in many different ways, but the first and most noticeable way was that it took place in a recreated version of the same showroom that Cristobal used to present his collections in. Then, as far as the clothing itself, Demna made direct reference to several of Cristobal's most iconic silhouettes, and in traditional fashion, he photographed them holding the number that had been assigned to their look. This actually used to serve a functional purpose, because if you were in the showroom and wanted to purchase one of the dresses, it was much easier to say, hey, I'd like to purchase the dress from Look 33, as opposed to describing it from memory. Now another thing that you'll notice with this collection is that there are a few colors sprinkled in, but other than that, it relies on an almost entirely black color palette, and this too is a reference to Cristobal's work. Black is often called the sum of all colors, and this is something that he explored deeply in his collections. In fact, in 2023, there's going to be an exhibit opening in the Netherlands called Balenciaga in Black, and the entire focus is to showcase Cristobal's proclivity towards the color. So clearly the brand's origins were a massive inspiration for Demna when designing this couture collection, but he did of course add a few twists of his own. Most notably, there were elements that one wouldn't typically expect in a high-end European couture collection, such as denim and hoodies. And then there were a few far-out elements such as the saucers that many of the models wore on their heads. I believe they were meant to be reminiscent of the wide-brimmed hats that some women would wear way back in the day, but there's something very futuristic about them. Either way, there were undoubtedly some interesting looks in this collection, and perhaps none more so than the final look, which featured a white dress and an eerie white veil to match. Unlike the hoodie and jeans, it's hard to imagine a scenario where one might wear this, but I believe that this actually served as the framework for the outfit Kim Kardashian would wear to the 2021 Met Gala, which leads me to what I'd like to talk about next, the relationship between Demna and Kanye West. As I was saying, Kim's outfit at the 2021 Met Gala was noticeably similar to the final look from Demna's 2021 Couture collection, and that's probably because her outfit was in fact designed by Demna. To take things a step further though, she appeared at the gala alongside a man in a black mask and hoodie. Most assumed that this was Kanye, because to be fair, this is the exact type of thing that he would wear, but it turns out that this was actually Demna. It's fairly common for designers to attend the Met Gala alongside the celebrities that they've dressed, but in this case, no one really knew that it was him. Now we don't have to dive too deep to figure out how the connection between Kim and Demna was formed, because we can reasonably assume that Kanye is the one who introduced them. As a matter of fact, Kanye was at Balenciaga's Fall 2021 Couture Show, but his connection with Demna doesn't start or end there. As we discussed earlier, Kanye had been a longtime supporter of the designer, dating all the way back to his appearance at one of the first Vetma shows in 2015. And from that point forward, Kanye remained one of his biggest supporters and was regularly seen wearing his pieces. The admiration between the two was mutual, and fast forward to 2021, Kanye asked Demna to assist with the creative direction of his highly anticipated studio album titled Donda. Specifically, this included helping plan the album's listening event at Soldier Field in Chicago. There ended up being several of these listening events, and in all of them, the apparel worn by Kanye and the other performers was designed by Demna. Among the most jaw-dropping moments was when Kim walked out wearing the same white dress from Demna's couture collection and renewed her vows with Kanye in front of thousands of fans. 
From there on out, Kanye was seen wearing Balenciaga just about everywhere he went. And when I say that he was wearing Balenciaga, I mean that he was only wearing Balenciaga. Despite having partnerships with both Adidas and The Gap, he opted to wear black Balenciaga pieces head to toe. From what I saw, he even stopped wearing Yeezys. The only real overlap was when he recruited Demna to help design a collection for The Gap, which would be called Yeezy Gap Engineered by Balenciaga. But other than that, it was pretty much just Balenciaga across the board. As far as what sparked this change in Kanye's wardrobe, it's hard to say, but we can assume that his relationship with Demna was a significant factor. I mean, the two of them were obviously on the same page about a lot of things. For instance, Kanye announced in October of 2021 that he would be changing his name to Ye, and in December of 2021, Demna followed suit by dropping his last name. I'll note that Kanye took things a step further by filing the paperwork to change his name legally, which Demna did not do, but the point is that they shared a similar mindset, and in many ways, they became creative muses for one another. We can even quantify Kanye's passion for Demna's work, because in July of 2022, he revealed that over the course of the prior 12 months, he had spent a total of $4 million at Balenciaga. That is a staggering amount, but I guess that's just what happens when a fashion-minded billionaire decides that he, and even the people around him, are only going to wear one brand. To take things a step further, Kanye even appeared as a model in Balenciaga's Spring 2023 Ready to Wear show, so between this and the Yeezy Gap collaborations, it was becoming clear that Kanye wasn't just a fan of Balenciaga, he was more like a brand ambassador. For a while, this seemed promising, as two of the biggest forces in fashion were now working together in a formal capacity, but then things took a turn. If you've been following the news at all recently, you'll know that Kanye has been stirring up a significant amount of controversy on account of his inflammatory comments about race and religion. Obviously, he received a ton of public backlash, and as expected, many of the major companies that he was working with began to cut ties with him, including Adidas, Gap, and Balenciaga. More specifically, it was Caring, Balenciaga's parent company, that issued a statement saying, Balenciaga has no longer any relationship, nor any plans for future projects related to this artist. So that's about as clear-cut as it gets, Balenciaga parted ways with Kanye. And to my knowledge, Demna has not publicly addressed that decision. This was the end of their business relationship, but was it the end of their personal relationship? I really don't know. But what I do know is that this was not the only controversy that Demna found himself tangled up in over the past few months. As you may have heard, the big headline right now is that Balenciaga shot an inappropriate holiday campaign featuring children. Let me say right now that I have no idea what they were thinking or how this was allowed to happen, but unfortunately it did happen, and in response many people are now boycotting the brand altogether. Balenciaga initially came out and said that they were filing a lawsuit against North Six, the marketing agency that they'd hired to work on the campaign, but since then, they've posted a statement on Instagram saying that they've decided not to pursue litigation, and they also outlined a plan to enforce stricter controls for their content validation process. Nevertheless, the damage has already been done, and as the creative director of Balenciaga, Demna has been thrown into the hot seat. In response, he posted a statement of his own on Instagram saying, I want to personally apologize for the wrong artistic choice of concept for the gifting campaign with the kids, and I take my responsibility. It was inappropriate to have kids promote objects that had nothing to do with them. He then goes on to say, I apologize to anyone offended by the visuals, and Balenciaga has guaranteed that adequate measures will be taken not only to avoid similar mistakes in the future, but also to take accountability in protecting child welfare in every way we can. So there you have his take on the situation. He's holding himself accountable for this, but is it too little too late? Perhaps it would have already happened by now, but this is definitely the type of thing that someone could lose their job over. I acknowledge that Balenciaga is a huge company that in any given year can generate nearly a billion dollars in revenue, so maybe it is possible that someone as high up as Demna doesn't personally direct or approve every single campaign that gets published. But that's not an excuse, it's a problem. And that's why they're making the changes that they are. I mean, at the end of the day, he is the creative director of the fashion house, which quite literally means that he directs its creative vision. So maybe it's time to move in a new direction. He can still be the one to lead Balenciaga in that new direction, but there clearly needs to be a change in tone. One of the difficult things here is that Balenciaga has differentiated itself as one of the most experimental brands in fashion. 
This is by no means the first provocative collection or campaign that they've ever done, but there's a difference between the type of controversy you create by selling $1,700 trash bags and the type of controversy you create by portraying children in an inappropriate manner. So their only options here are to focus on the prior while making sure that line is not crossed, or they can rein in their approach altogether. What I mean by this is that I expect the next few seasons of Balenciaga could be relatively tame. No gimmicks, no social commentary, just thought-provoking clothing. Demna's certainly capable of that, he's done it time and time again at both Balenciaga and Vetmom, but for now, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And the really interesting question here is if other brands owned by Kering, such as Gucci, Saint Laurent, and Bottega, will follow in Balenciaga's footsteps by taking steps to make sure that mistakes like this don't happen. But aside from all of that, the big takeaway here is that this isn't about money for Balenciaga, it's really about reputation. I've heard many people say that they'll no longer be wearing the brand because of this whole scandal, and that's completely justified. So moving forward, rebuilding that reputation is going to be Demna's single greatest challenge. As far as how he'll do it, I'm not sure, but either way, it's safe to say that this will go down as a major turning point in his career. After everything that we've discussed in this video, hopefully you can see why I find Demna to be one of the most enigmatic figures in the fashion industry today. At a young age, he was forced to flee his home country of Georgia due to political unrest, and in pursuit of a more stable life, he eventually earned a degree in economics and planned to be in finance. Yet deep down inside, he knew that this wasn't true to who he was. He knew that there was something else out there waiting for him, and all he had to do was go and get it. So despite having no design background, he applied to the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp and was miraculously accepted. From there he worked his way up the ladder and was able to break into the fashion industry by working for labels such as Walter van Beerendonk, Margiela, and Louis Vuitton, but even then, he knew his journey was far from finished. Desperate for the opportunity to create things that he wanted to create, he helped found the collective Vetma, which in the coming years would become one of the most talked about things in fashion. By way of the collective's rise to stardom, Demna himself became a star, and that's why Balenciaga decided to take a chance by inviting him to be the brand's creative director. That was back in 2015, and since then, he's reinvented the fashion house in ways that no one could have ever imagined he would. In doing so, he's often paid homage to the house's roots, but at the same time, he's really made it his own. Whether or not that's for the best, you're entitled to your own opinion, but at just 41 years old, Demna is still building his legacy. So far, he's put together a stellar one, but as we discussed, there is still a lot of work to be done in light of recent controversies. That's why I personally believe he will be one of the most fascinating designers to follow in the coming years. Will he stay at Balenciaga? Will he rejoin Vetma? Or will he launch a new label of his own? If we've learned anything from his story, it's that his next move is almost impossible to predict. And at the end of the day, that's what makes Demna, Demna.